guys, Matt Lipke here with Through Gamer Goggles, gamer-goggles.com. Today we're going to talk about Grim, Grim Slingers by Steven Gibson. Uh, and it's being produced by Greenbrier Games. Your first chance to not so much preview this game because there's other people who have done it already on YouTube and whatnot. But the first time to actually see the game physically will be at Gen Con 2016. Um, I'll put their booth up here if I remember that when I get that far. Uh, but there's two ways, two ways to play Grim Slingers. Um, one is the cooperative method, which we're going to talk about last, and the other is versus, or what I like to call a dual system. Basically, it's a head-to-head -head game for two players, or you can play with as many as six players. Uh, you can play the cooperative game with as many as four players, uh, but in the versus system, basically, you have your Grim Slinger, which we'll talk about background of what a Grim Slinger is in a second. Uh, you have your basic spells. Um, with the advanced rules, you can have an archetype, which affects your starting setup, basically. It gives you a special ability as a witch. And what else? What else? You can play with equipment, which you don't start the game with. Uh, I suppose you could if you wanted to make that subset of rules. Um, and you can start with, um, uh, what are they called? It's, uh, extra spells, which are uh, signature spells. That's the word I was looking for. Um, so there's a lot of room to grow with the duels game or the versus system. And the versus system really is a stepping stone into the more complicated co-op play. Or I, I'm going to call it slightly more complicated. So I really do suggest that you start with the versus system. Now, what is Grim Slingers? Well, Grim Slingers, as you can tell, kind of has a, a Wild West theme. So it's, uh, imagine, um, 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 witches in the West, uh, in a godforsaken land. So... Uh, I go out west, well, not, not as much as I used to, but I've been out there. So you imagine a desert, and I take it, and I make it worse than it actually is. Uh, so imagine cracked earth and all that fun stuff. And imagine witches that are both cyborgs and uh, use elemental magic to do their bidding. And basically what you're doing, well, in the, the versus system, you just have shootouts, basically. Uh, in the storyline, in the story version, the narrative, which is this entire book here, you you basically are kind of looking for the Witch King, who is actually responsible for you being a Grimslinger. Uh, I'm not going to go too much further with that right now. Uh, so basically, if you play the Versus system, you can play a game in 15 to 30 minutes. Uh, there's, like as I mentioned, there's some advanced rules for playing the Versus system. Well, one of the coolest things is they have a quick draw option, which is recommended for more than two players. Uh, well, it actually says with three players in the book, but we played it with three and four players and five players, and we didn't really see a difference um, uh, when, well, no, let me rephrase that. There's a big difference in playing without quick draw, but when you play... Uh, with more than three players, it doesn't seem the, the quick draw always makes the game faster. Is what I'm trying to say, and that was the wrong way to say that. Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? There was something else I was thinking about. Oh, um, and then if you play, start to play through the storyline, the narrative, it's uh, going to take you roughly an hour a chapter maybe 90 minutes. Uh, when you're first learning, easily you can dive into two, two and a half hours playing through your first one if you uh, look for a lot of answers to be very precise. Um, with that said, there's about four chapters in the book. You can spend, if, you know, if it's all 90 minutes, you can spend about six or seven hours playing the game once you understand the rules. So with all that said, we're going to jump on over and we're going to look at duels and then we're going to look at some of the differences in the narrative system. Uh, and you're going to see right off the bat there's some changes. Be right back. All right. Before we carry it away and start actually showing you how a duel works or a versus head-to-head -head game works, we're going to start off with the basics. Um, where's my rule book? I don't remember the perfect layout of everything. So when you set up your game, every player gets a Grimslinger. Every player gets an Anima. Uh, aside from the way they look, they don't really have any effect on gameplay. Uh, basically, you take a health tracker. You set your character to 10, and you set your anima to 10. Now your anima does have some things that are worth noting that you're going to want to keep in mind. Um, you can reload, which when you cast spells, they end up in the graveyard. Um, and then you can reload for the cost of 3 EP, 
and this is basically your number counter. It goes up and down. Uh, and then you can also purge. You can discard spells to gain um, EP for them. So there's a little bit of resource management going on in the game right from the get-go. And it can be crucial. Uh, some of that can be done with the spells. Every player starts with the six basic elemental spells. Uh, we'll go over the spells right now. Like, there's the speed is always first, and then it tells you what they can do. Single target. Uh, I'm going to use equipment cards for some of the other things because they actually carry over. So this is single target and standard. That's when you can play it. It has a speed of four. This one can be played during the standoff. It's self or team if you're playing a team game. Um, and then this one is a combined. So what this this actually. I can't remember any signature spells that have it, but I bet there are uh, some spells where you can combine things with other things. So basically, you would put you would play this card with wind when we get into playing spells, and it adds two extra damage. So your basic spells are earth, lightning, ice, water, fire, wind. Now, if you're familiar with the game and you want to step it up, you can add a signature spell right off the bat or two. Um, you can also, if you're playing in the advanced game, you can add equipment, which you don't necessarily, you don't start the game with. I suppose you can house rule it that you do. Uh, and you can play with archetypes, which there's six, I think, in the main game. Um, there's the revenant, and what the revenants, what the archetypes do is they give you a special ability, which is on the back side of the card. And they also allow you, they, they start you at a different health than the 10 that everybody starts with. Um, and, and EP. So Revenant, uh, you start at 6 and have 10 EP. HP reaches 0, you can exchange EP to give yourself health points and come back to life effectively. Uh, the Daemon uh, is 9 HP and 8 HP allows you uh, to take, spend during the standoff phase, it allows you to spend 2 EP and any damage you take this turn is added to any element spell you play next turn. Uh, so if you suspect they're going to gang up on you and you're going to take like 8 damage uh, in one round, then uh, this would be a good time to use that. Uh, Vampire, uh, for 3 EP you can steal up to 2 HP and 1 EP from a foe. Uh, that's actually really good that it's written that way because in the the versus game, it's an opponent, and in the narrative, it's uh, one of the monsters that you might have to fight. Outlaw, 8 and 8, probably the most balanced of the bunch. Um, during the draw phase, you can spend 2 EP in addition to its cost uh, after you would have, and everybody's got their face down cards, which you'll see that in play in a second. Uh, your card will do damage, will, will do no damage, but the FX it has will be applied. Uh, you may pick a new target if the spell is target. So, oops, if the spell is a single target. Uh, forgotten, 10 HP, 7 EP. Oh, I haven't played with this one yet. Oh, it's True Grit. Anytime you spend 1 EP to reduce, you may spend 1 EP to reduce damage taken. It's uh, not as good as it sounds. <laughs> and then there's the Witchborn, um, which during standoff phase, you may spend 2 EP to increase the number value, NV is number value, of your next spell's FX or effect by one and reduce its uh, RN by two. And you can't go lower than two. And your RN is your, is the, um, where is it? Oh. The RN is this number. So it basically allows you to jump, jump the gun and shoot first. So we're going to back off here a little bit, finish uh, setting up a little, set the equipment off to the side, set that off to the side. All right, so... Uh, when you're playing, okay, so you have a discard pile here. Let's say this would be for cast spells, and you have a deactivated pile. Uh, more often than not, when we've played, deactivation has not come into effect that much. It's a little bit awkward in, in the sense that you have to remember it's there. Uh, but once you get used to it, it's not a problem at all. It's only awkward at first, uh, and basically what happens is like, Something makes your spell get deactivated, it goes in this pile, and then at the start of the next standoff phase, it goes back to the player's hand. So basically what's happening is, at the start of the next turn, you don't have access to this this pile, basically. 
And there's a lot of cards. Like you can see that. Um, let's see here. Oh, this card. One active card. Uh, the, all those different spells have different abilities. It's like uh, wind, for example, is one spell uh, that deactivates cards. And active cards are cards that are in a player's hand. Uh, so basically, wind uh, on first turn make them deactivate three cards. So it's going to limit them to the two two cards they end up with on the first turn. Um, now it's also important to note. We'll zoom in here. So when you're playing the verse the VS duels version of the game, you have uh, wind. So if we're going to get into the duel in a minute, but if wind is played against ice. Ice beats wind automatically. Um, and with that said, we're going to move right into the duels because I'm just going to show you. Oh, actually, I had the uh, table set up for three players, but I only had three sets, of, or for four players, and I only had three sets of cards, um, which made my demo really off. Uh, so, after standoff, you go into the draw phase, which draws basically exactly what you're doing. You're taking your hand and you're selecting your spells. Uh, I may change things up a little bit as we play. I want to make sure that I have green targets red, pink targets red. No. I want to make sure this is the pink player so and this is the green player. I want to make sure that they're targeting each other. So I'm going to select their spells together so that I can demonstrate to you um, how the number value decks work. And really, this guy's spell doesn't matter, so we can do that. Flip it over. Flip it over. Now we have, well, select a spell for this guy. Red target's pink. Put that on the bottom. Uh, we know that this is a green player, so we're just going to go with fire. Wait, wait, wait. What spell is that? Um, turn this red. We're going to do that. We will put that on the bottom. Yeah. Doesn't matter what spell that is, so we're just going to put that there. And, and we're going to put that there. And we're going to see what, what unfolds. Like I said, I might fudge this because it's really hard for my brain to process this order. I'm just going to set all the spells aside because I'm only going to go through quick draw once. Really, it's the third time uh, because I've made a lot of mistakes um, teaching you this so far. So now let's hope that I can do this in an unadulterated fashion. Now, you enter the, well, you end the draw phase. And actually, before I go any farther, uh, in the quick draw game, for every set of target cards, for every, there's there's multiple, there's like mini rounds. So you're going to yell draw, you're going to flip it over, and then you're gonna effectively going to enter the aftermath phase, which is where you calculate all damage, all effects, a um, couple other things, uh, depending on which version of the game you're playing. So, draw! Boom. Boom. Okay, so, we have... We have pink targeting green, and I'm actually going to do this so we know who's who. Just like that, so we can keep a visual. And we'll move this down just a hair, okay? So we have pink targeting green, and red, or, wait, er, red, you're on here, let's see, red targets green. And green targets red. So, you flip over the spells, which in the basic game, all of the spells... Ah, what happened here? You belong there. And you belong there. All the spells have the same... All the basic elements have the same speed. So, what's going to happen here is you, you can roll off to see whose spell happens first or, or whatever. Um... Generally, what we do is if somebody's uncontested in a three-player game, we let them resolve first. So, the, the pink player targets the green player. The, the green player is going to take two damage and randomly 
discard one active card. So one active card will go to his his discard pile. And that that's effectively done. Now these two players are, are actually contesting each other. But uh, I'm going to zoom in here real quick. So normally when you're contesting a player, you're going to go to the number value card. And you're going to effectively play off. But fire beats ice. Ice beats wind. Fire beats ice, so because that therefore it's uncontested. The green player would take two damage and randomly discard another card. Uh, then his spell gets discarded. At least that's how we've been playing. That might be an error. Um, then you finish that aftermath phase and you go draw. And we have a pink player targeting a red player, so those two are contested. And like I said, we will do... Uh, I am actually going to change his spell here real quick because that's not... I want to be a little bit more educational. Um, so, fire hits the pink player for two damage, which this is the pink player. One, two damage, puts him to eight, and he discards a spell from his hand, which he used ice. Would go here, like so. Um, and then these two players have to play the contested version because the two spells don't automatically beat each other, so he draws a five, he draws a four, this is the first player, seven, uh, he's not going to pass, you can, okay, like I said, your goal is 11 points, uh, it's a lot like 21, um, you can pass or hold, oh, well, I'll come back to that in a second, so they're tied, clearly he wants to go up one, he's at a ten, that's not so good for him, but it's not good for him either, there's two of each card in this deck from one to five, so he's at nine. He's going to hold. He can decide to take the damage, or he can draw a card. There's a five in here, a four in here, a three in here, and two ones. Wait, that's not right. My, I, maybe I don't have all my cards here. A five, a four, Two ones. So, he's got a 50-50 chance of drawing a one and tying. He ties. He no longer has a 50-50 chance of hitting the, let's see, he's at, he's at 10. He can't draw a two. He can only draw a one. So they're going to tie. On a tie, pretty much nothing happens. So, let's do this real quick. Let's fudge some stuff. This is an if-then statement. He exhausted. He would take double damage. In this case, the darts are combined with the wind. It gives the damage plus two, so that makes it three. He would take six damage and randomly deactivate three cards from his hand, which on that player's side of the board would put him here. Um, they would go to a standoff phase. They would go through their standoff phase. And then they would go back into their draw phase, and he would get his cards back. Uh, at the after they, I said that wrong. They would go into the draw phase. They would go draw, and then before before the spell cards are flipped, these cards would return to his hand. The timing's a little bit odd on it, but basically what this is is it's an every other turn kind of timer so that you don't have the cards back in your hand at the start of your turn to select from them. Um, boom, 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 boom. So that goes there. Now, if this was, let's see, he's at 10. Uh, so that's 7, 5 is 12. He's over. Well, we'll do that in a second. So let's say that's 11. That's an 11. So basically he would add plus 1 damage to his ability, so he would take 
uh, so his number value, so it would be 2, 5, or 2, 4, and 3 cards. Um, let's say he drew this, and that's 8 and 4 is 12, so he's over, so that would be double damage on top of the bonus from the uh, hitting Apex. Now you would go into your next round, and you would start all that over again. Um, I like the quick draw rules because of the fact that everybody is staying involved the uh, whole time. Um, I'm going to just kind of shuffle all these off to the side. I'm going to get rid of all right, the target so card. And we're gonna move. When you move into the narrative side of the game, there are some interesting changes. Um, one, you're playing with... Well, you can actually play the solo. Uh, in, I haven't tried that yet. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping to do that before Gen Con. Um, with that said, some of the, the major changes are... Alright, so the first thing that changes is you play with an archetype for sure. It, there's no other way to play it. So you can play with one and then you... Um, this determines your starting points. Um, you add a level tracker which is marked over here. You start at level one. Uh, you move it up and down, and then it does things like increases your max hand size. Uh, when you can draw a signature spell, which these are over here, you can earn those other ways as well. Uh, your uh, item cards, which we'll zoom in for this real quick, because I want to point this out. Okay, so when you set up your item card for the dual or the versus system, there's uh, a bunch of cards with the red dot and some cards with this blue border. Those are for the narrative version of the game only. So you would have to add those to this when you start to play. Uh, then there's this guy. You can actually earn him. We haven't managed to earn him yet. You uh, find three shards of a crystal and you can gain Hank the Hunter for use. Um, up here, you have the number deck the event deck, all the different creature decks, every creature deck except for the Witch King, which we haven't got to see yet how vicious he is, and I'm guessing he's pretty vicious, has three skill skill cards for the particular creature. Then there is, uh, based off of the difficulty level and stuff that you're playing, there's some creature modifiers, which we actually haven't seen these come into play yet. Um, and then there's uh, three skill creature cards, and we'll get into that in a second because the biggest change, well, outside of telling a story, is the in the in using the map? Where's my meeple? Uh, in the basic game, you start off at Valley Haven, so you got a meeple to represent that. Um, the other difference is that you start off with two supply cards, and the supply cards are all the same. Uh, well, I guess it depends on which game you're playing. Um, we've only played with three players, so you would start off with two of these supplies, and they can be in your hand or they can be in your stash. Your stash can be accessed at different times during the narrative portion of the story. Then over here, you have your regular discard pile. And this is actually your discard pile for equipment. You have your regular discard pile and your deactivated pile. So I'm going to clean this off the board here real quick. Uh, I'm going to go over the map. We're going to zoom in. I'm going to chat about the map. Uh, I'm going to move pretty much everything else out of the way, I think, because we don't need it yet. That's probably big enough. Uh, the map pretty much has all the information you need uh, for using the map. We're going to go over some things here. Uh, landmarks, they all have uh, part of this different, they have different things that they do during the story. Um, if your quest is to go to a particular place, make sure you read through the whole quest before you get there because there are times that uh, something happens and you get distracted and you go on a, a side quest, for a better way to put it. Um, but the landmarks all have particular page numbers where they give you a description of what you can and can't do there. Um, one allows you to trade, one allows you to basically, like the Lone Titan, it allows you to feed a Titan that's buried in the earth. Um, and he will talk to you for hours on end and give you information. Uh, there's an attack encounter um, where every one of these X's, so if you go from Valley Haven to here, you are going to roll the die. Do, 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 do. I rolled a two, so you would have to fight the jackalope, which we actually haven't fought yet. Um, 
So we'll get to that in a second, and I'll show you how that works based off of the number of players, etc. Uh, and then you can go here and you have an event, and you basically what you would do is you would flip over the top card of the event deck, you would read it, uh, and you would follow the actions on the card. Um, and rest. Rest allows you basically to have like a standoff phase, heal, um, gain health points. There's other things within the storyline that allow you to do that too, like your animal will talk to you about being a witch born, and um, at the end of that he might rejuvenate you. So, like I said, the biggest change is combat. We're going to use uh, the Spectre because it is my favorite picture. So, you flip the Spectre over here and you look at it. So, you have different things that um, range here. So, if you're playing a one player game, it has 10 hit points and 6 EP. Two players, it has 14. Three players, 18. So, let's say we're playing the three player game. You would put this card here and then you would take the uh, health tracker and the energy tracker and you would verify what health and stuff it needs to be at. So it's 18 and 12. You would find the appropriate number, which I think this is actually a really good way to use cards. Um, I was quite impressed with how, how this works well together. And that is how you track the health. And then you would basically enter your standoff phase. And during your standoff phase in the narrative version, you can, you can access your stash, you can rearrange the cards in your hand, uh, and you can do everything else that you can do in the basic duel. So from here on out, it pretty much follows the basic rules as it's guided by different things. Um, if you manage to defeat the Spectre or any monster, you would look at their card, you would flip it over and read what you get. You almost always get an item when you defeat a creature. Now, uh, that is pretty much the differences between the narrative and the Grimslinger. I will, I, well, I'll come back to this in a second. Uh, I'm going to go switch, switch positions and uh, I'm going to go over what I think about Grimslingers as a whole. So what do I think of Grimslingers? Well, one, I love the fiction and the story behind the game. And well, I, I just love that whole American frontier era. And I love the fact that, you know, you've got all this magic and cybernetics coming into play. I see a lot of potential for Grimslingers, not only as the card game that it is, but a lot of other types. This would be a brilliant role-playing game. Uh, moving on, there's two ways to play the game. Uh, there's the, the VS system, or the Versus system, and then there's the cooperative game. The Versus system, the, 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 here's the whole story. The whole story is that we made some mistakes um, the first couple times we played and the game seemed a little bit more challenging. And then we played the right way, and while gameplay sped way up, the game didn't seem like there was, much, there was as much thought going into trying to outwit your opponents. And maybe that's because we went from playing with four players to three players for that. So that, that's a huge difference. Um, and this, actually, too, the other thing that made it faster, too, is we didn't play with archetypes the uh, second time we played. So... I think that the Versus system is very solid in it. You can easily, in your store or wherever, run tournaments playing Grimslingers. Are you going to replace Magic the Gathering or Yu-Gi-Oh with this? Probably not. That doesn't mean players aren't going to be interested in doing it. Uh, where the game really starts to take off, though, is at the co-op game. Um, now, here's the story. Uh, and to make, you know, to make the long story short... While we were learning, we went through what I call training, which is playing head-to-head -head and then playing a three-player game with quick draw rules and moving into the cooperative game. And we did this over the course of a week and a half to two weeks. Uh, we finished up with the cooperative game yesterday, playing through a chapter and a, por a portion of the next chapter. Uh, and I'm not going to get to play any more before Gen Con, so that's why I'm doing this video now. But here's, here's what happened. I wanted to play, um, I was a little bit grudgingly trying not to play the cooperative version because I figured the cooperative version wasn't going to be as fun. Uh, my son was absolutely against playing 
Grim Slingers. I actually had to make him play or kind of threaten him to be grounded um, because I really wanted the experience with three players. And we went around and around a little bit with attitude and things of that nature. Um, and we spent some time going through the rules, trying to figure out things we were doing. Uh, like, uh, what was the big one? One thing that we never, oh, we were like, what happens when you're defeated? Um, the rules aren't very clear on that uh, portion of it. So we just played that you were knocked out and during combat you didn't get to come back. Which I think is what the rules imply. Uh, because otherwise, some of the things in the story don't make sense. Which I didn't talk about that in the earlier part. If you ever get defeated or knocked down to zero hit points um, and you can't replenish them, you're considered defeated. And based off of whether or not it's a part of the story, um, an event, or whether or not it's in a, uh, a fight card or a fight section of the map, uh, different things happen. Um, most of the time in a story event, if all, all the players get defeated, you just lose the game, uh, which makes it really hard. Now, we were playing on the hard, I think it's called hard, whatever it is, it was the medium. It was the most, most medium difficulty. Um, it wasn't insanely difficult. Uh, we actually did very well, I think. Um, I don't have anything else to go on. But at the end of the game, we had been in a lot of combat. And uh, my wife and myself had both hit level 7 and my son had hit level 5. So, with that being said, if you that was the first chapter. If you were to come back and start at chapter 2, you would start at level 4. Um, you know, that, that's one of the other th cool things about the game is you don't have to just play all the way through the stories and, and remember where you were at. Another cool thing about the game is you get to pick your difficulty a lot like a video game, which is where I think this can actually draw a lot of players is off of video games. You've got that type of different varying level. You can jump right in and play the most difficult section or, or not. Uh, but to finish the story, we went from grudgingly wanting to play, and largely that was because of some of the attitudes at the table, uh, to not wanting to stop, to recording where our characters were at in the game. And when I say our characters, my son did all the work. The one that didn't want to play the game did a full turnaround to play the game. Now, my concern about Grimslingers, and, and actually a couple of other things that I would like to see for Grimslingers, uh, my concern is that they're not going to be able to keep up with giving new, giving new narratives. Uh, but I think there's going to be a big enough fan base for this where people are going to want to write. Every Grim Slinger was created, not, not you know, I don't, I'm pretty sure that like Tony Galati when he created his Grim Slinger didn't do the art. So when I say created the idea, the concept for that particular Grim Slinger was fan based. So there's a huge fan base for this game already. Uh, I wish that there was like double-sided playmats for the different things for the cards. Um, not, not a board, but playmats that you can just roll out and bam. Um, it's all right there. I think that would make, uh, that would be beautiful for the game. The other thing I wish is that the box was a little bit bigger. I mean, I understand the, why the box is the size it is, but I wish it had little dividers for the different things. Other than that, the game is solid, people. It is solid. Um, Last night at 10 o'clock, we stopped playing. This morning, my son asked if we were going to play again. And, you know, when you go, when you totally flip a teenager around on a game, something's right. Thanks for watching, and have a good day.